and welcome to The Courage to Speak with me, Leonie Mellinger, the podcast that asks, what does it take to have the courage to speak up and speak out in life? Having coached people in the art of communication for over 20 years, and from my own experience, I know that speaking with confidence is a skill that can be learnt and honed. I'll be talking to my guests about their relationship to speaking out and speaking up, looking at the journey this has taken them on from childhood to the present, the experiences they've had both worst and best, hilarious and painful, and how over time they've managed to overcome their fears and have the courage to speak. My guest today is journalist and broadcaster John Snow. John joined ITN in 1976, reporting from Africa, the Middle East and Europe. He served as Washington correspondent from 1983 to 1987, diplomatic correspondent from 1987 to 1989 and main anchor of Channel 4 News from 1989 to 2021. He reported the fall of Idi Amin in Uganda, the revolution in Iran, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the release of Nelson Mandela, the earthquakes in Kashmir and Haiti, and the elections of Margaret Thatcher, Tony Blair and Barack Obama. John is known for his distinctive style of reporting and interviewing, often asking tough questions of politicians and other public figures. As well as presenting Channel 4 News, he's also hosted numerous televised public debates and presented many documentaries. John was honoured with the BAFTA Fellowship in 2015. In 2016, he accepted the BAFTA for news coverage of the Paris Massacre. He has won the Television Society's Presenter of the Year Award five times, Journalist of the Year 2006 and the BAFTA Award for the Best Factual Contribution to UK Television in 2005. He has served on the boards of Britain's National Gallery and Tate Gallery, and he served for 30 years as chairman of the New Horizon Youth Centre, a London day centre for homeless and vulnerable teenagers. He is also chair of the Heart of England Forest. John, welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to me asking you questions. Well, what a treat. To be invited in to talk about oneself instead of everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are certainly uh, an example of somebody who has the courage to speak. But was it always like that? I'm interested to hear what was the Snow family dinner table like for you? Pretty chaotic, to be honest. Um, my older brother was a very opinionated and talkative boy right. uh, who was constantly clashing with my father, who was an authoritative sort of um, public school headmaster um, and there were endless verbal fights uh, and did you join in with that or? no I think I was sort of alienated by it a bit because my mother would end up crying oh no um, and uh, my younger brother and I were somewhat left um, not quite sure what to do with ourselves oh so your father uh, was was quite overbearing then well he was six foot eight for a start oh my goodness so he was right. a big man and when he became a bishop, of course, he was about 10 foot in a mitre. Oh, so, my goodness. I mean, not that he sat at table with a mitre, but, I mean, <laughs> he, but he had that feeling that he was very big. And what was the, the influence on you of your mother? Huge. Um, she was a very sensitive woman, and she had suffered grievously from alopecia. Oh, dear. So she right. had no hair right. of her own, and she wore a wig. Mm. And, of course, it was something we didn't know about when we were tiny children. You didn't realise? No. And uh, then we had to be told when they had a car accident and then she had some sort of a scar which meant she couldn't really wear the wig properly and all that. Oh dear. So they then told us and that was a shock. You know, what else is false? Yes. Is she my mother? All that. Um, but she was a wonderful woman and, and a very, very brilliant pianist. Oh. And I think would have been a concert pianist if she had not been afflicted in that way. So your father was the one who was far more outspoken and, and your mother quieter? He kind of had to be. He was six foot eight and you right. can't shut up at no. six foot eight. So, so did that make you feel you couldn't speak out then when you were younger? Not really. Um, it, it, I think it possibly made me bide my time. Right. Um, it didn't put me off speaking. 
Yes. But it seemed to me there was enough row going on without me having to join it. Yeah. My older brother was very militant and subsequently became a trade union leader. Okay. And, and you know, that kind of, you know, nailed him. Yeah. Um, and so the, the rest of us were reasonably well behaved. And you, you joined a choir, I think. Did, yes, did, did I, that help build your confidence? Well, my mother's musicality, which is partly why I loved her so much, right. recognised at a very early age that I could sing. Ah. Because I, she would be sing, playing Brahms. Yes. And I would pick up elements of it. Yes. And stand by the piano and hum or sing. Oh. And I do remember her saying to my father, George, George, the boy can sing. <laughs> um, and... Of course, they were really looking for a cheap bargain. They wanted a cheap private school. Um, so what better than to send him off to a choir school? I see. And um, I was put in for voice trials at Winchester Cathedral. And I was selected. And I think it was the beginning of the rest of my life. Really? Because I think, first of all, it affected my articulation. Yes. I think it made me love cadence. And it also taught me to sing. Oh, fantastic. So that, yeah, that must have had an effect on your confidence. And then what effect did public school have on you? Public school is a mixed experience. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really mind it, mm. although it was a very strange thing not living at home. Yes. Um, How old were you when you went? Uh, 13. Was it board? It was a boarding? Boarding school. I had boarded as a chorister as well. Oh, right. Um, I don't know. I mean, it wasn't community. Mm. It wasn't being plugged into the locale. No. Um, it was something which didn't really fit. And the older you got, the less it fit, fitted. Yes. And what, what effect did it have on, on the way you spoke and, and behaved? Well, I, of course, I spoke very, very uh, <laughs> posh. You know, yeah. I, um, <laughs> it clearly affected the way I spoke. You know, yes. question. But then, then so did my parents. Yes. I mean, they spoke like that too. My father had been to Winchester and it was that sort of language down by the dining table. And, and, and I think sometimes in these institutions there's a kind of institutionalised way of talking, isn't there? There is. Did you find that? To an extent. Yeah. And then there was a use of language by them that left us in the dark anyway. Yes. I mean, they were, yes. there were codes and all sorts of other things. And, and the, because my father was a cleric, yeah. there were all sorts of religious references and stuff. Yeah. Which flew over our heads. I'm sure, I'm sure. But did you find whilst there that you started to speak out more than you had when you were younger or, or were you still fairly reticent at that stage? No, I think um, in my teens I did begin to speak out. Right. Um, I think anybody who's plunged into a public school is either going to swim with it and get into the first 11. Yes. Or he's going to rebel. Exactly. And I rebelled. You did? I did. All oh, right. So but I rebelled much more when I got to university. Right. Well, we'll get to that. But first of all, I wanted to ask you about the next step, which was, I think, Scarborough Technical College. Scarborough Tech, I was the only one there what didn't talk like that. And John <laughs> Snow, you're going to Lancaster of piss. What do you talk like that for? <laughs> oh, so you changed your, your I accent. didn't. I couldn't. You... But, but I was well aware of what people thought. Right. Mm. And so what was the change in you of going there? Um... I think I learned a huge amount, actually. Yeah. I mean, it was a very levelling experience. Yes. Um, because they were, of course, much brighter than I was. Um, well, I wasn't very bright anyway. But really? I mean, no. <laughs> well, I'd been told I wasn't very bright. And you discovered, I think, um, was it pubs and women there, I believe? Pubs, women and council houses. Oh. I mean, I lived in a council house with Mrs Pickering. Oh, did you? Yes. Um, and she was delightful, and I don't think she had any idea how much I would eat. <laughs> and she had to send a plea to my parents to up the rent. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and so then you went, I believe, to Uganda, is that, is that right? Yeah, I, 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 I volunteered for voluntary service overseas. Okay. You can never dictate where you're going to go. You have no idea where you will go. And I barely knew where Uganda was. In fact, I'm not sure I did. Uh, but that's where they sent me to teach at Kamuli College on the banks of the Nile, 30, 40 miles north of Lake Victoria, 30 or 40 miles away from anywhere really built up or That must developed. have been a huge culture shock. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, I mean, there were perhaps four or five other white people on the, on, on the staff, 
But for the rest, I was a case of total immersion. How did you find it? Loved it. Every minute of it. It was... What, abs- did, you, what did you love about it? What I loved about it was that there, there was a tremendous enthusiasm by the kids to learn. Yes. They also didn't treat me like they spoke to other people. Most of the other... There were only three or four other white people, but they were priests. Yes. Uh, and I was normal. Right. So... Um, <laughs> so did they confide in you? And yes, and, you, you know, yeah. we had fun. Yes. It was good. So you were teaching them? I was teaching, yeah. That, that's... Um, I mean, that in itself is quite a skill. Um, well, you say so, and mm. I'm sure that's right. Mm. Um, I'm not even sure that I had had the skill, but... I enjoyed it, and to some extent it seemed to work. Yes, and you had a great rapport I did. With, with them. I yeah. did. And so what impact did that whole experience have on you as a person? You, you came back maybe a bit different from that? Well, I think what it did was to multiculturalize me. Right. So I really understood the mix of culture and and also the world was no longer white. Yes. Um, I mean, because I'd grown up in the country, yeah. I didn't know any people of colour in Britain. Yes. There was one boy from the West Indies in my boarding school. Right. And so that was the only black person I'd ever yes. met. Uh, and suddenly I was the only white person, you know, for miles around. Right. And, of course, it very quickly didn't make any difference at all. Mm. I mean, they were just like me. Yes. Um I suppose I had a slightly wider life experience. Yes. But there were also things I had not experienced. Yeah. Like, you know, having to work in the paddy fields at three or four, you know, or five or six. I mean, the whole family was... Yeah. You know, the culture was all all shoulders to the wheel. Gosh, so you came back and then went to Liverpool University, I think. Yeah, I had a big struggle getting into university because I had very poor A-levels. Yeah, I think I had a C, a D, and an E, okay. which were really very, very <laughs> right. poor, very poor. So, how did you get in? I think my father pulled some strings. Did he? Um, though, how quite how he managed to pull strings in the state sector, I don't know. Yeah. But um, well, I went to. I think. Did I do this before VSO or after? No, it must have been before. I went to, to Scarborough Tech. Yeah. To up my A levels. Yeah. So I did have adequate A-levels, if, if of oh. rather poor quality. Okay, right. But um, I know my dad met the Chancellor, or no, the head of the law faculty oh, right. at Liverpool University. Yes. He was on a train. Yes. This man was a, a Welshman who um, was had been MP in Lloyd George's seat. Oh. Um, and what on earth they found to talk about it with each <laughs> other on the train, I don't know, because my father was the most liberal man that could ever have come along. But... <laughs> He said it was no Lloyd George. Yeah. But uh, th- th- this lovely man said, well, we'll, we'll send him along and we'll see what we can do. <laughs> and you were sent along? And, and I was that sent was along, it. so I mean, he got me in through the back door. OK. Um, but then I think something happened, didn't it? Well, I mean, obviously I'd been in Uganda. I'd lived in a multicultural society, yes. a largely black society. Yes. And Lord Salisbury was a very white man indeed. Yes. And he was the Chancellor of the University. And we said he was just completely ill-suited to be the figurehead. Right. Let alone the main influence at the top of the university. And he had to go. Yeah. And I was charged with meeting him off the train from London when he had come on one of his rare visits. Yes. uh, And telling him he wasn't really wanted on the, you know, doing the job anymore. My gosh. He said, well, very well. I shan't come any further. I've never liked coming here in the first place. <laughs> and we did go back on the train and left. And that was the last any of us ever saw him. But, oh my of course, goodness. the authorities were absolutely scandalised. I'm sure. And ten of us were sent down. We were only sent down for two or three years, but that's a heck of a lot of time at 18 or 19. Oh, my goodness. But I'm not sorry it happened. How, what gave you the courage to do that I mean that takes I think, quite a I lot. think VSO in Uganda I mean I just I just couldn't bear the fact that here was this man who knew nothing about significant quantities of people within the university for a start in Liverpool for a second and in the country for a third yes. even then mm. and the idea that he was responsible for 
the, being the figurehead for a multicultural university just didn't stack up. Right. And he was just a snob and a worm. <laughs> but if you hadn't gone to Uganda, you probably would never have done never, it. Never, never. So it really Well, did. I wouldn't have had the armoury. No, exactly. It armed me. Yes. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I wasn't in Uganda plowing some great political learning no, experience. No, no. I loved Uganda. Mm. I loved the society. I loved the community. And I loved the reality, which was that I was living a life that I could have lived in England. Yes. Of course, with different levels and standards and whatever. But it was community. Yes. Uh, and I was accepted completely. And and I felt I owed it. Yes. So what happened then? So your, your strong feelings about uh, apartheid and inequality were really what first mm, motivated you to 100%. speak out in, no. in the, and and the result of that was you were said I mean your father must have been mortified. Oh God, well, funnily enough, I think there was a streak in him, which slightly respected what I'd done. Oh. I mean, the headmaster in him said he was absolutely scandalised, but but there was I think a streak, uh, and I think in my mother too. Yes. Uh, that that yes, it was a bad thing that he'd got himself th- thrown out, mm. but the cause was right. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, so what happened next? Well, um, then, of course, I had to get a job. <laughs> I mean, there was no prospect of immediately getting into some other university. Yes. Not with that record. No. Uh, and it was, in those days, not many people had sit-ins and things always like that. Yeah. And um, to be sent down made the papers. So I, I'm not sure I'd have been welcomed with open arms anywhere. But... Um, uh, a friend of my cousin Peter Snow, mm. who was a broadcaster, mm. yes. um, had a friend who was Lord, Lord Longford's secretary. Longford was a, a big-time sort of humanist, yes. Catholic um, at the same time, and, and a do-gooder, yeah. and doing a lot of good and also slightly bonkers, as <laughs> you know, the aristocracy often are. My cousin Peter's friend said, you know, Longford is looking for somebody to run a day centre for homeless and vulnerable teenagers. Do you think John might be interested in that? Oh. Well, well I mean, had I ever run a train set? Um, <laughs> but I said yes. And it was in Covent Garden. I lived above the shop. Oh. Um, and um, it was a most shocking introduction to the true state of humanity. Kids were uh, very vulnerable. Yes. Homeless, um, unemployed, and needed a lot of help. And we built a team of about 15 of us. Longford helped us fund it, yes. biting various trusts and people to give us money. And uh, it was an amazing learning experience for me. It must have been. And yeah. at the same time, a wonderful experience, because we could see what we were doing was making a difference. Yes. And... Um, it became reasonably well funded mm. and I stayed there for three years and lived there in the vegetable market in <laughs> Covent Garden before it had moved and it was an amazing experience. So that again would have had a profound effect on you and your feelings about inequality oh, which you've gone on to talk a lot about. Yes, because yeah. I mean combination of Uganda and New Horizon as the centre was called uh, kind of introduced me to a world that of course I'd never even heard of, let alone lived. Yes, I'm. I'm sure uh, it must have. And and I I've seen that coming out in you when I've watched you as, as a as a journalist. Well, I I think it's rather good because I've always been a fan of of your what I call Menschlichkeit, which is the German word for humanity. And, uh, and I, I think one could often see the strength of your emotions when, when you were reporting. And I really, I really valued that and I liked it. And it was authentic rather than some journalists who you feel... Well, a, well I don't think one needs to wear it on one's sleeve. But I think if one is not affected by what one sees, how are you going to get the viewer to be affected by what they're seeing? True. And it's not that I was getting affected in order to be affected and affect therefore the viewer. It was just, I simply was affected... And in being affected, I reported as an affected person. I tried to hose it down a bit. Yeah. And sometimes my editors would tell me to hose it down. <laughs> um, but I wanted people to experience what I was experiencing in meeting these people. 
So do you think that that kind of empathy is a positive uh, for a journalist or is it a negative? Because you're supposed to sort of go slightly in the middle, aren't you? Well, you say slightly in the middle. I say it's essential that an element of you must plug in and understand this and feel it. Yes. At the same time, if you get carried away by it, yes. you end up trying to do a job which you're not yeah. involved in. Yes, yes. Well, I thought it was fantastic. Um, and I, I, I really loved watching you because of that, because I could see the authenticity. But I, you've, I've, I've heard you say a strong conviction is a dangerous thing for a journalist to be in possession of, and we're not supposed to have views and we're not allowed to share our views with the public. Um, so for someone who's clearly always had strong views, how did you manage it all those years? Well, I think I leaked them out, actually, frankly. Um, I mean, I knew what I was doing. Yeah. But I knew that you couldn't go too far. I mean, first of all, you had to avoid ever being party political. Yes. Or in any way being misinterpreted as being party political. Yes. But being on the side of the underdog or, you know. Yes. There were all sorts of, I mean, a, a real attempt in it so much as you could, as a white man, understand what people who were not white were going through, for example, in yeah. this country. Because it was a time of immense melting pot. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing now, actually, to live in Britain and see how things have, to a very large extent, settled. It is not perfect by any means. Yes. But in those days, you know, this was new. Mm. You know, and, and there, were, there were indigenous Brits who felt very resentful of housing lists being distorted by immigration, etc., etc. Yeah. And so one was treading something very delicate, but it wasn't these people's fault that this thing was happening. There was no point taking it out on them. Mm. You had to try and explain how things were and why they were and be understanding of various different quadrants. Mm. I mean, obviously, as a journalist, your, your own views must surely colour the way in which you report the news. So... I, I wouldn't like to be caught admitting that, but right. it's absolutely true. But therefore, can you ever be truly objective? No. You can't, you? can't, can you? possibly. No. No. And if you are, then you're a bore. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, because actually the best journalism is felt. Yes. Felt yes. by the receiver and felt to some extent by the deliverer. Yes, yes, very much so. You said in your, in your book, um, The State of Us, that, that you you objectively managed to report the atro the atrocities you saw under Idi Amin's hmm. reign, which involved the most dreadful human suffering. But you found it harder to be objective when reporting on Brexit. Hmm. How, how is that? Well, I, th I think something like the Idi Amin regime in Uganda was so glaringly appalling. It was... It was horrid because it had a pantomimic element to it too, which was even worse. Yes. I mean, not worse than the racism, but the idea that anybody could be playing with race yes. and, and hatred and, and and threat and death. Yes. Um, so that was mm. that was something that was simply required reporting. Yes. I think the contrast is that, I mean, Brexit was... I felt actually was also about community. Yes, very much Not so. Not just the economic community that we were hoping we would stay in. Yes. Um, but, um, but the sense of our obligation to each other that actually economically, morally, uh, in terms of human relations, mm. to be within this huge block that had once killed each other. Yes. Not once, but twice. Yes. In the most bloody way. This was a miracle. This mm. was something unbelievable. Mm. And we were saying, I don't think we need that. And anyway, it stinks. No, please, mm. God, just think of what we've been through. Mm. Maybe we weren't born. I wasn't born until 1947. But, I mean, mm. I knew what I was growing up from. Yes. And uh, it utterly shocked me that anybody could find the idea of not joining the European Union as anything other than insane. Yes. Um, <clears throat> in your book, The State of Us, you, you say that you think you and other journalists failed to educate people about the effects of Brexit pre the referendum. Mm. And you said we failed to be the truth tellers. 
looking back, would what would you like to have communicated about the effects of Brexit so that people might have been better informed? It's a very big question. I think the the, the first thing is that, of course, we are regulated in the media. Mm. And on all sides in that great debate uh, as to whether we were yeah. going to join the European Union or not, or yeah. remain in it or whatever, um, on all sides, th- there was a um, a real sensitivity about what you could and couldn't say as a journalist. You know, what was your objective obligation? What, you, how could you, how could you tell this story, and keep to the the truth? And you often couldn't because it was so complex. It was, and yeah. such wicked arguments were being deployed too, yeah. that were really cover for. I think blatant racism in yeah. some cases. Yeah. Um, and there were a lot of people stalking the land who didn't want anybody else's language knocking around here. Yeah. Um, and certainly didn't want any dependence on, you know, countries that we didn't control. Yes. You know, it's fine to be dependent on a on a colony that you have thoroughly locked down and put a nice big military presence in. Yes. That's one thing. But to be dependent on people who speak French or German or Finnish. No, please God. So were you given strict guidelines about what you could and couldn't say about Brexit? We weren't, but it it, it, it all conformed to the way journalism worked. Mm. Um, you know, the government of the day was fighting a particular corner. Yes. The opposition was fighting another. You can't take sides in all this. Yes. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet very often it was nothing to do with taking sides. It was taking sides with truth. Must have been quite difficult for you. I to think manage. it was a very, very difficult time indeed. Mm. Very difficult. Mm. And the funny thing is, I had started off as a student as relatively anti uh, European because I didn't like the idea of a rich world and a poor world. I felt that the more we banded together, the less good it was for the rest of the world. I see. Um, um, which is a very funny and eccentric sort of student kind of position. <laughs> but obviously, by the time I was a reporter, I believed passionately. I mean, given history, given two world wars and all the rest of it, and given humanity, Mm. the idea that we would not join the European Union and not work together with people who spoke a different Mm. language, etc., you know, was mad. How, How on earth did you deal as a journalist with somebody that you might have been interviewing who said, I want my country back? Love me. It was hard. I it bet. was very hard. I want my country back. When did you ever have it, sir? <laughs> and what did it look like when you had it? You know, I mean, you know, you just wonder what on earth this guy's talking about. <laughs> but you can't say I that, want can my you? country back. <laughs> yeah. But you've got it all the time. Yeah. I want my country back. Mm. Um, and you said, well, it, this is also an issue of economics. Mm. This is an issue of race. Mm. This is an issue of nationalism. Mm. You know, this is so complicated, you can't reduce it to what you've decided to reduce it to. Mm. Which is why they lost, because it wouldn't stand up. Yes. And now that you're free from the constraints of being the news anchor of Channel 4, are you enjoying the ability to, to speak freely on any subject? I am, but at the same time, the truth is you're not really in a position to pontificate on any subject. Because the fact is there are other people who are still employed who can pontificate. Right. Um, they don't need you. But you, um, can, but you can if you want to. I can if I want, and I do occasionally. But, I mean, yes. generally speaking, um, you know, I mean, if somebody asks me to do something, I tend to do it. But not, I don't go looking for it. Right. But I am 75. That's no excuse. Um, What effect did the advent of social media have on you as a journalist? Massive. In what way? Massive. Yeah. Well, because for all those years as a journalist, in the end you'd been constrained as to what you could actually do. Yes. You had to conform to certain standards, positions, whatever. And it would be, you know, it would influence and conse- have consequences of your career if yes. you veered far off the railway lines. Yes. It very quickly became clear with the social media that actually the bosses could no longer control you. The fact is, well, they couldn't even keep up with reading whatever you were doing. <laughs> I mean, 
you know, you'd have to say something very extreme and be complained about by a very large number of people for everyone ever to notice that you'd said something naughty. Really? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think, so, I so think the social network just completely blew the thing to pieces. So you It was on a vast scale. What are your thoughts on Gary Lineker being taken off air for his observations of, of members of government's use of language? Well, interestingly, he was taken off air off a state broadcaster, mm -hmm. which was potty trained and knew exactly how to handle these things, although they proved to Gary, Gary Lineker that they didn't know how to handle these things. But anyway, but they were, they were empowered to deal with it. Yes. And they dealt with it and it didn't work very well. Yes. I mean, Gary Lineker survived, thank God. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, um, I think it was a good illustration of the fact that actually the thing is out of their hands now. Do you think so? Because I do. I, I would have thought that would put other people off because there was such a f furore. But he prevailed. He did. He's there. And I think it proved, actually, you've got to be very careful with the way you try to, you know, reorganise things once they're out of the bottle. Yes, indeed. Um, Sacking somebody who's, you know, got a vast following, knows a huge amount about the subject, is bloody good, and all that. I'm afraid it's bigger than you. Social media, though, um, enables people to say things they wouldn't dream of saying in person. And we know that uh, that can lead to negative communication, such, such as trolling. But do you think there's any positive uh, about being able to speak out anonymously? Not much, no. no. I, I don't search for it myself. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't bother with something that is anonymous, frankly. Yeah. And nor would I want to be anonymous. No, exactly. You know, so if you, if, you if I believe in something, I'd like to use my name to promote it. Quite right, exactly. And has social media, you think, helped bring pressure to bear on the government? I think it has. Is that a good I thing? Do. I think it's a good thing. I mean, because there's only an election every five years. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're, you know, uh, free to do, well, free from criticism in the meantime or, or advice even. Hmm. And I think I think the social network has proved a valve for useful communication. It has. It hmm. ha I think so. I don't think we're all craving to have it closed down. Hmm. Not at all. No. Nor could they anyway. Our our own BBC is supposedly represents free press, but what would you say to people who believe that the BBC is actually biased? I don't believe the BBC is biased. You don't think so? Well, and bias involves having to be one track in a particular direction and I think that's very hard to prove of the BBC. But they do get criticised sometimes. They do. Don't they? I mean you know the, the BBC has a lot of enemies yes. because it's not private enterprise. Mm. Well forget it I'm sorry it's an absolutely brilliant service which is the envy of the world. It is. And I think most people would go to the post to um, defend it. Yes. And I think we're blessed. I think it's absolutely... I've never worked for the BBC. They probably wouldn't ever have me. Um, <laughs> Is that because the, you're too outspoken? It's too outspoken. But, <laughs> but, well, that's probably a good thing. Yes. And probably illustrates that they are what they should be. Yes, that's um, true, actually. The very fact yeah. they don't employ me. Yeah. Um, I, no, I think, uh, I think it's just right the way it is. Good. Well, I agree with you, actually. Yeah. Um, you, you said... Um, that when reporting in, in Iran, mm. local people uh, were viewed, uh, when they were talking to Westerners such as you, they were viewed with, with suspicion um, and, and that those who, who spoke to you had the courage to do so because they were driven by some higher purpose. And is, is, is this something, do you think, is this higher purpose the thing that we all need to give us the courage to speak up? I think we all have the potential for it. I'm sure even in China people have the potential for it, although it's very hard to spot. Um, but the and Iran, of course, are there are repercussions of speaking out in places such as China. Or, there or, are indeed, but I mean, it doesn't mean that people don't actually mm. feel yes. and perhaps talk in the corner. Yes. Uh, we don't really know what, no. what the real level of resistance or challenge is in China. Yes. Well, we think it's pretty low, but we don't really know. One day there might be a shock. Yes. We just have no way of knowing. Yes. Uh, and it's extraordinary that in this age we don't know. Um, we think we know, but I don't think we know for sure. And I suppose some people have a higher purpose and some people don't, hmm. it seems to me, and which is why they just sort of 
are happy to, to walk through life. But sometimes a higher purpose is kindled by events. True, or experiences and, such yeah. as yours, which and is... you never knew you had it. Yes, like going to Uganda or... Yeah, or whatever. Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. H- have you ever had any negative experiences speaking out in front of people? Not that I recall. I mean, I, I never see challenge or rejection even yeah. as a negative experience. I'm glad they've engaged. Yes. Did you have some difficult interviews? Well, you must have had some very tricky interviews. Well, in theory, yes. I mean, if you can think of interviewing Idi Amin. Uh, you, you'd think you probably would certainly upset him, which was easily done. Yes. Um, but upset people at home? Did you challenge an enough? I mean, were you afraid of being stabbed in the back? I mean, what's the problem? Yeah. Um, I don't know. No, I mean, no, I, it, I didn't really feel much mm. in that direction. Mm. And and can you think of a time when you felt worried speaking up about something because you feared the response? Well, that, that, that's a big question. It takes me back to my student days. Yes. Where, um, you know, we became convinced of what I think was a truth, but never expressed, which is that this very senior lord, Lord Salisbury, yes, who happened to be the Chancellor of the University, was a racist, and I was now a racist. Yes. And he said some terrible things on the record in the House of Lords and elsewhere. Yeah. And um, he was not an appropriate person to be the Chancellor of a multicultural yeah. um, university. Mm. And uh, we concluded you ought to go. Yes. And that's how I got into so much trouble because yes. we, we campaigned mm. relentlessly. But were you were you worried about the consequences? No. You didn't. You, so you, did you realise you were probably going to be chucked out because of that? I don't think I realised it. And I, I might well have had it in the back of my mind, but realisation is making sense of it too, I think, and I don't think I ever did. Um, but... I, I I just was absolutely sure we were right, and we were. If you'd known the consequences, would you have still done it? I would. You would? I would. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. Really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was a life-changing experience. Well, it was, yes. It, it made your life go in a totally different direction, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, no. yeah. Is there Has there ever been a time where you wish you had spoken up and didn't? Well, I mean, there must have been masses of them, but... Mm. But they would have been about doing something for an individual or something that looked small but actually was very big to the person who needed it. Yes, yes. And, and I was going to ask you, that: do you feel having a profile means you have, you've, you have the sense of responsibility that you should be speaking out for others who can't? Oh, I think that's uh, overwhelmingly true, yes. And I think the awful danger with the reporting was that you... You would be sent on an event or a story or whatever, uh, and and you would encounter something which absolutely needed to be reported. Yes. And, you know, there was the danger that you wouldn't get it right. Yeah. Uh, that was always in, in one's mind. You've said that um, earlier in your career you didn't you didn't want to be known as a troublemaker uh, because you wanted to become the news anchor. So looking back, would you have liked to have spoken up more than you did because you were deliberately trying not to be known as a troublemaker, otherwise you wouldn't have probably got the job? I'm actually surprised now that I look back to see that I actually did do as much as I did. Yes. Um, I thought I was more cowardly than that, but it seems that I did do more than I did. You certainly did, and, yeah. Uh, so I, don't, I have no regrets at all. No. no. And to be honest, if it had ended with defenestration... Well, it sort of did, because I never got a degree. Yeah. But, I mean, being the, uh, the, the news anchor, um, they wouldn't have given you the job if, if they thought that you, you were going to be speaking out too much, would they? So, no, because there's a good gap between one and the other. Yeah. And I'd purged my sins to some extent by a long record of reporting. Yes, yes. And I, I, I mean, I, think, I, on, I actually think lots of people had no idea that I'd been thrown out of university. Yes, <laughs> but, but as a when you were um, be- before you became news anchor as a journalist, um, were you quite outspoken in in the way that you went about things then? I think so. I don't, mm. don't think I held back. Yeah. Um, 
And I think very often the best answers you ever got were the most, those that were posed in the most provocative way. Which of the Prime Ministers you've interviewed did you enjoy most? Margaret Talking. Thatcher. Really? Why is that? Because she was a woman. Yes. And she used her being a woman in a very a creative and to some extent um, combative way. Yes. Because she would both flirt and damn within seconds and you never <laughs> quite knew where you were. Sometimes she'd be thrilled to see you. Oh, John, how very nice to see you. Yes, marvellous. Um, and then she'd absolutely shit on you. <laughs> but you enjoyed that. <laughs> Loved it. Loved it. It's sort of straightforward sadomasochism. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and who was the worst? <laughs> the worst? Well, it's it's a bit cruel to talk about the worst. I suppose I mean, it is really. But... Well, and in a sense, they all had their pluses. Yes. Um, but dear old Ted Heath was a little bit boring. Was he? Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a privilege to be anywhere near any of them. Yes. Was it difficult to get near them? Not particularly. It yeah. surprised me. Right. And when I went to Washington as a correspondent, mm. the efforts that the... Americans went to to ensure you didn't get too close to anybody, considering really? they were the land of the free. Yes, um, yes. It was something quite fantastic. And have you ever been inspired by somebody else's courage to speak out? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, he was thought at the time as a, an extremist, but John Pilger mm. was an amazing mm. reporter for the yes. Daily Mirror. Yes. And did come up with really remarkable revelations and but he was a total f hate figure to the, to the right. Yes, yes. He was amazing, yeah. And what advice would you give somebody who just does not feel brave and courageous such as you and, and just doesn't feel able to speak out? What, what, how could they take the first step, do you think? That's a very big question because it, it, it's not as simple as that, really, is it? I think that you've got to be true to yourself. Don't find yourself doing something, saying something, reporting something, being something that you're absolutely not. You don't need to be. Be yourself. Be true to yourself. And in being true to yourself, you're true to the people you're trying to inform. John, thank you so much. That has been fascinating. I really thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much. I feel very privileged to have been talked to. Thanks for listening to The Courage to Speak, presented by me, Leonie Mellinger. The Courage to Speak is produced by Anushka Warden, with sound production by Theo Bosenket, and music by Guy Pearson. For more information on The Courage to Speak, visit www.mellinger.co.uk.